Well, good morning. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 22? Uh, Luke 22 is where we're going to be primarily this morning. Um, I was uh, had the privilege this past uh, week to get away for a couple of days with my family, uh, my in-laws. They, uh, they have a home over um, in St. Augustine, and so we were over there and uh, had a great time with the kids and uh, got to see the old city and look at the fort and uh, obviously go uh, to the beach over there. And if you've uh, been to the beach over on that side of the state, you know that the waves are a little bit different than the waves over here. Uh, the, the bay doesn't seem to get much of a surf, um, if we can really even call it a surf anywhere in Florida. For those of us who've been elsewhere, um, we know that there's not much really surfing happening here. But uh, my, my kids obviously love to play in the water and uh, we, were, uh, we were over there, and uh, they were <clears throat> playing this game where they would uh, run out into uh, the water, and once they got out there, uh, they would uh, throw themselves uh, on their bellies, and they would try to let the waves uh, bring them up to the uh, shore. And um, my, my oldest, uh, she uh, is almost five, and she was doing this pretty easily, and the waves were pushing her back. My little guy, uh, he has classic uh, little sibling syndrome, which means he wants to do everything that his big sissy is doing. And uh, the problem is uh, he's not as big as his big sissy. And uh, so he was out there doing the same thing, running, throwing himself onto the ground, and uh, when this would happen, though, the problem is the waves were just so big uh, that they wouldn't carry him in. Uh, they would carry him under. Um, and so he would get uh, splashed and shoved underwater, and he'd come up, and he would have water in his eyes and in his nose. And, uh, but he wanted to keep doing what his sissy was doing. And so he decided to change his strategy up. And what he started doing was instead of running and throwing himself into the waves, he instead would run and throw himself onto my leg and cling to me like a koala bear. And he would grab on as tight as he could, and when the wave would come, the wave would crash up against him, but he would not be knocked uh, over. And I was just struck by this, uh, this image of in the midst of chaos, the more he tried to fight the chaos on his own, the more he actually ended up being overcome by the chaos. But when he surrendered his ability and clung to his father, he actually found a way to weather the storm. If nothing else, this weekend has reminded us of this one fact. We live in a chaotic world. And I think that in the midst of a chaotic world, we can find ourselves barely getting above water for breath. And I've been struck just by the question of, okay, well, in the midst of a chaotic world, what does the world need from the church? And I've kind of arrived at this conclusion. A chaotic world needs a surrendered church. And I don't mean a church that's surrendered to the waves of culture. I don't mean a church that is surrendered to what is new in the air that day. I'm talking about a church that is fully surrendered to Jesus. That has said, we will stop fighting these battles the way that we think we should. We will, not, we will stop fighting against the waves in a way that looks best to us. But instead, we will surrender what we think is best and cling to our Father. A surrendered church. You say, well, Chris, I feel like that's Christianity 101, right? If we are a church, doesn't that mean that we are surrendered? I don't necessarily think that that's true. Because I think that it actually is possible for us to be saved, but not surrendered. That is to say, it is possible for us to have made a decision to follow Jesus and yet still have areas of our hearts and our lives that have not been completely given over to Jesus. So this morning, I want to just help us from God's word see how we can be a church that's surrendered. And I just want to answer that simple question. How can I know? If I am surrendered, how can I know if I am surrendered? Similar to how when you go to the doctor and uh, you say, hey, I'm feeling a little bit sick, they begin to ask you some questions about what? Your symptoms. So I have a cough and my throat is a little itchy and I have a runny nose. Maybe you have a cold. Today, I want to give us some diagnostics, if you will, some symptom checkers 
that we could use to see if we truly are a church that is surrendered. And to show you, I think, this reality in Scripture that we can be saved by Jesus but not completely surrendered to him, I want to look at a story found in Luke chapter 22 about a man that many of us are probably very familiar with by the name of Peter. Before we get there to kind of just set the, the, the tone of this moment, I want to recap a little bit of Peter's life up to this point. You see, uh, when we first meet Peter, he is doing what he has been raised to do. That is, he is a fisherman. His dad was a fisherman. His granddad was a fisherman. His granddad's granddad was a fisherman and so on and so forth. That's how things worked in this day and age. In this time period in which the biblical text is written, uh, you did not really have career aspirations. You did what your family did. If your family was into carpentry, you became a carpenter, a blacksmith, a blacksmith, and Peter's case, a fisherman. One night he's out fishing and he catches nothing. He comes to the shore and on the shore is Jesus. Now he doesn't know Jesus personally yet, uh, but he's heard a lot about him. And Jesus says, well, how was the fishing last night? He says, well, not that great. Uh, We didn't catch much. He says, why don't you go back out and you cast out again uh, one more time? And it doesn't say this in the text, but I'm sure that Peter's probably thinking, brother, you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. Why don't you leave the fishing to me? But upon Jesus' request and because of the trust that he has based upon what he's hearing about this man, he goes and casts his net one more time. And when he does, he catches the most miraculous catch of fish he's ever seen in his entire life. It's more fish than he's ever caught. The Bible says that it's so many fish that when he brings them into his boat, his boat begins to sink because of the weight of the fish. He brings them onto the shore. He throws all the fish onto the beach. This is more revenue than he's ever seen in his entire life. And then Jesus says, hey, I want you to leave that and I want you to follow me. You'll no longer fish for fish. Now you will fish for people. And in a moment of faith, Peter says, yes. He leaves his old life to walk into a new life that God has called him into. Fast forward into the story, and Peter uh, and his uh, other friends, the disciples of Jesus, his closest followers, they're in a boat. Jesus is off praying somewhere, and a massive storm hits the boat. Think hurricane force winds, waves that are capsizing over the vessel. They think they're about to go under, and Jesus is nowhere to be found, but then they look out over the water. Is it a ghost? Is it a plane? They didn't say the second part. No, it's actually Jesus walking on the water towards them. Everyone is freaking out, and Peter looks at Jesus and says, Lord, if you call me, I know that I can walk on water to you. Jesus says, come to me. And in faith, as long as he keeps his eyes on Jesus, Peter literally walks on water. There's another moment where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and at one point, Peter says, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And in that moment, Jesus actually changes his name, which was formerly Simon, to Peter, which is what we know him as now, which means rock. Meaning the confession you just made, what you just said about my identity, I'm going to build my church on that confession, on that truth. I give you those moments because I want to set this next story we're going to read in context. Because if we at any point could have stopped Peter's life, paused everything, grabbed a microphone, interviewed him and said, Peter, can we get a little bit of an update on you following Jesus? How are things going? I think he'd be honest and say, I'm kind of crushing it right now. Anybody else walked on water recently? No, was that just me? (laughs) He has a relationship with Jesus. He's following Jesus. He's professing Jesus. But I think he's still not completely surrendered. And the reason why I can say that is because of the text we're going to read in Luke chapter 22. This is the moment right after Jesus' final supper with his disciples. He's just gone to a garden to pray. And we know because we know how the story is going to go, that the next morning he's going to be crucified. This is his last night prior to his death. He's in the garden, he's praying, and all of a sudden he is arrested. And in his arrest, he's taken away. And we pick up the story in Luke chapter 22, verse 54. It says this. It says, Then seizing him, they led him away, and they took him into the house of the high priest, And meanwhile, it says that Peter was following him at a distance. I want you, if you have a pen, underline that phrase, circle that phrase. We're going to come back to it. Peter was following at a distance, and they lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, and Peter sat among them. So here's the the stage. Jesus is taken to uh, the house of a high priest. Think of a house in the Mediterranean. There are no closed windows. Everything is open, and there's a courtyard where people from the public can come and uh, listen on. These are the people who are looking for the gossip. They're trying to see what's actually happening here to Jesus. 
Peter follows along and sits in the courtyard with these folks, and we see what happens next. Then a servant girl saw him sitting in the light, and she looked closely at him, and she said, well, this, this man was with him too, but he denied it and said, woman, I don't know him. A little bit later, someone else saw him and said, no, you're one of them too. And he says, man, I am not, Peter said. And then it says about an hour later. Now, I love that line because Luke, who wrote this gospel, is a doctor, which means he's very detail-oriented, which you would want your doctors to be. Meaning, when you study the book of Luke, understand that everything is there on purpose. There is no word that is chosen on accident. About an hour later, meaning for an hour, Peter sat. Remembering the fact that he had just denied his Lord twice. Giving himself every opportunity in that hour to go, actually, hey, this is going to be awkward, but I do know him. I do follow him. He is my Lord. At any point in that hour, he can turn away from what he is deciding to do. But you know what happened to him in that hour? It's the same thing that happens to so many of us when we make a decision that is sinful. Shame steps in. And shame is an emotion created by the enemy to keep us in bondage. In the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, it says that when they sinned, what did they realize? That they were naked and then they were what? Ashamed. Guilt can be from God, but shame is only from the enemy. Guilt says I have done a bad thing. Shame says I am the bad thing that I have done. I can imagine here in this moment the mental turmoil that Peter is going through, recognizing that he is not doing what God had called him to do. An hour later, another kept insisting. This man is certainly with him since he is also a Galilean. And then Peter replies and he says this. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And then immediately, while he was still speaking, what happens? A rooster crowed. And then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And why is that significant? Because Jesus told Peter that night at their dinner, their final meal, that you are going to deny me tonight. And Peter says, that's not going to happen. But this is a moment where Jesus is being confirmed as, again, being God, knowing what's going to happen. The rooster crows, Jesus looks at him, and then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Then he went outside and he wept bitterly. Upon this rock, I will build my church. I will leave my old way of life to follow you, Jesus. If you call me Christ, I will come out onto the water and I believe that I can walk because of my faith in you. And yet now we're sitting here. And we're denying Jesus. Why? Because you can be saved but not surrendered. And church, again to what I said earlier, in a world and in a moment today where we can look at today and point fingers in every direction because of the state of our world and the state of our country, I just want to challenge us to wonder this one thought. Could we point the fingers at ourselves? And could we ask ourselves the question, are we the church that this world needs? I think we can be. But it will only come if we have hearts that are completely surrendered to Jesus. So how can I know if I'm actually surrendered or not? Again, I want to give you some maybe diagnosing questions this morning. Some things that you can hold on to to go, hey, maybe that's true of me. Maybe that's an area of my life that's not surrendered. And again, to put all the cards on the table, this is not someone coming to you with a message in an area of expertise I truly believe that following Jesus is a daily participation in surrender, meaning as I have been working through this text, letting this message preach to me before I would ever preach it to you, I can see in my own life areas and aspects of my heart that are not completely surrendered. So I want to invite you into a space to be challenged this morning, but I think that in this challenge, we can walk out more fully devoted followers of Christ, but also more in love with the Jesus who saved us. So how can I know? If I'm not surrendered, here's the first thing. It's this. The opinion of others is a major thing, not a minor thing. How could you know if you're not completely surrendered? Look at how you see the opinion of other people about you. Is it a major thing or is it a minor thing? Three different moments in the story where Peter is asked, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? And in all three of those moments, he denies it. Why? Well, I think a couple reasons. One, the most extreme reason, 
to identify himself with Jesus might result in him having a future like Jesus. He might be arrested. He might be put on trial and he might be executed. But I think there's actually a deeper level to this. And it's all found in an interaction he has, I think, with one of the individuals in this story, a slave woman. Some of your translations might even say a servant girl. She makes a claim that he is following Jesus to which he denies. Now, why would he deny that? I find it alarming that he would for a couple of reasons. One, let's break down who this person is and their identity that it's given. They're a slave, meaning they do not belong to themselves. They are someone else's property. They are also a woman. And unfortunately, during this time period, if you were a woman, you did not have the same rights as men. You really did not have any rights whatsoever. In fact, if you witnessed a murder happen and you were a female, you saw the knife go into somebody else's heart, you did not have the ability legally to testify against that person in court because your testimony, according to their culture, could not be trusted. By the way, a caveat, not related to this story, this is why I believe the resurrection is a true historical fact because who were the first people to see Jesus alive and preach the gospel about Christ? Women. And if you're trying to make up a story and make it believable, you're not going to have women find a a dead person alive. Meaning in this story, this woman, even if she believed that this man, Peter, was a follower of Jesus, she could not testify against him. And yet Peter still denies. Why? I think it's because he's consumed with these people and what they would think about him. Because association with Jesus would ultimately mean them thinking less of him. And that's what happens, folks, when on the throne of our hearts is the idol of us. Because when you are, when, when you are on the throne of your heart, when yourself is on the throne, the worship of others becomes the currency that drives your life. And what is their worship? It's their opinion and affirmation of you. I think about this in my own life, by the way, how I can walk out of a meeting and immediately go, man, how do they think that I took that? Like, did I react the right way? Did I say the right things there? Man, what are they thinking about my family? What we do and don't do, what we make or what we don't make, where we live or where we don't live. What about my kids, where they go to school or where they don't go to school, where they ended up going to college or where they didn't go to college? What what do people think about me? And unfortunately, we can find ourselves living our entire lives based upon the opinions of other people. The problem is when we live that way, we can't be fully surrendered to Jesus. You want to know why? Because ultimately, when you look for the opinions and affirmations of others, what are you looking for? You're looking to serve yourself. And the problem with serving yourself and living as someone in service to yourself is that we will either serve Jesus and die to ourselves or we will serve ourselves and put Jesus back on the cross. Because he is going to get in the way of the worship that we are longing for. And I don't think many of us wake up in the morning and go, today I really want to be worshiped. Maybe our toddlers do, but not us. (laughs) But in our actions we say that. And when I am so consumed with what you think about me, you know what I can never actually do? Love you. Because I'm too concerned with manufacturing my life in a way where I am seen in the light that I want to be seen. And that's why we long for the opinions of others, isn't it? Because we want want people to see us. Look at me. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at the money that I've made. Look at where my kids go to school. Look at how great my marriage is. Look at this, look at this, look at this. And what I find so interesting in this story is that what happens immediately following Peter's denial of Jesus? Three times he denies, the rooster crows. And then what happens? It says that Jesus looked at him. In fact, what's interesting is that the exact phrasing is it says that the Lord turned and looked straight at him. In verse 61, that word there, looked, is not the word for like glance or happen to see. 
It's the word that is used to talk about intently staring at something, fixating your attention on that thing. In fact, elsewhere it is used in the Gospels about how Jesus looks at things, and it's always in moments of compassion. Because that's how Jesus operates. He has the ability, because he is not existing to serve himself. The Son of Man did not come to this earth to be served, but to what? To serve. Because he is so fixated on the world around him, when he looks at the world, he can look at the world with compassion and not condemnation. It's really difficult to look at the world with compassion when we are consumed with ourselves. I heard someone talk about recently, they said the sooner that a person learns the 20-40-60 rule, the better. Do you know the 20-40-60 rule? The sooner you learn it, the better. So it's a good day to be at church because I'm going to teach it to you. 20-40-60. When you're 20, all you can think about is what other people think about you. When you're 40, all you can think about is what other people think about you, but you don't care because you're 40. You don't think that that's a cool shirt? Whatever. I got a little bit of a dad bod. Who cares? But then when you turn 60, you know what you realize? No one's thinking about you. They're too busy thinking about themselves. The opinions of others is a major thing, not a minor thing. If that's true of you and me, it could be possible that we don't have things completely surrendered to Jesus. But here's the next thing. Following Jesus, my relationship with Jesus, is based upon convenience. It's not costly. You want to know if you're living a surrendered life? Look at your relationship with Jesus. Is it convenient or is it costly? If we could put the first verse up there one more time, Luke chapter 22, verse 54. After they seize him, look at what it says. He led him away, brought him to the high priest's house, and then says this. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. Okay, so we can pause the story right there. We can grab Peter. We can get a microphone and do like an on-field interview and say, hey, Peter, quick question for you. Are you still following Jesus? And we give him the mic and Peter could say, yes. I'm following Jesus. Just close enough that it doesn't actually affect or disrupt my life. At a distance. So he's there and I'm here. I'm following him, but I'm not following him close enough to be disrupted. I'm not following him close enough to actually have things changed or affected or made different in my life because of my affiliation and relationship with him. This is a temptation that too many of us, especially those of us, who have grown up in church can fall into because we know how to play the part. We know how to speak the language. We know how to make it look like I'm following Jesus when we, when we know well and good that we are actually not. That we are following him, but at a safe enough distance to not actually be affected by our relationship with him. He could have followed Jesus to an extent here that could have made him a criminal as well. Arrested alongside him maybe even crucified the next morning. But Peter doesn't do that. He just follows at a distance. If we are living lives, again, where we are serving ourselves, the question we ask in every situation is how will this cost me the very least? Um, a few weeks ago, I got a phone call that no one wants to get. We come home from um, a trip and a half of our house had no electricity. So I had an electrician come out, and I thought it was just a couple fuses that needed to be replaced, maybe a couple hundred bucks. The electrician calls me and says, all right, you got two options. One will cost you very little, but it won't solve any of your problems. The other is going to cost you a lot, but it will fix everything. Which one do you want to do? I said, sir, you shouldn't have asked me which one do I want to do, because I don't want to spend any money. Hey, I have come to give you life and life to its fullest. What does that mean for me? It means that you would pick up your cross and you would die daily. You would count the cost. Jesus, I'm not experiencing the life and abundance that you've offered me. I don't have the joy that you've given me. Could it be because our entire life and your entire life is built asking this question? How can I follow Jesus just close enough to not let it actually affect and change my life? I want you, Jesus, on the bad days, but I don't want you to speak into things when they're going well. When was the last time Jesus told you no? When was the last time you said no to something because of your relationship with Jesus? I would argue if you have not said no to something recently in light of your relationship with Christ, you're not following Jesus. You're following a different God. They're made in your own image, and you don't tell yourself no very often, and neither do I. We are professionals at justifying and making excuses for why we can live a way that we want to live. And I would just tell you, 
True joy is found in ultimate surrender. And we don't realize that in an attempt to manufacture our life in a way that following Jesus doesn't cost me anything, what I'm actually doing is I'm creating a life that is built on sand. And when the waves come and when the wind blows and when the rain falls, my foundation will be just that, sinking sand. It will fall and I will not need to be surprised when I look up and see my kingdom that I have built crumbling. My relationship with Jesus is convenient. It's not costly. Could be a reason why we are not surrendered. And here's the last thing. It's this. My response to sin is regret, not repentance. Regret, not repentance. The last verse in the story, if we could put up there one more time. Peter hears the rooster crow, and then what happens? It says that he went outside, and he what? He wept bitterly. He went outside and wept bitterly. That looks like Peter's changed. That looks like something is different in him. That looks like a night at camp. We've gone outside and we've wept bitterly because of what God has done in our life. I feel bad because of my sin. I feel bad because of what I have done. But you know what Peter doesn't do here? He doesn't actually repent. What is repentance? Repentance is turning away from one thing and going towards another thing. It's actually a political word during this time period. When a new king or emperor would take over a territory, they would send preachers out to this territory. These preachers would travel into cities, and they would come in, and they would say, here's the good news. Caesar is Lord. Repent and believe, meaning turn away from your old life and follow this new leader that is now in charge. That is repentance. Too many of us, though, we mistake and we conflate regret with repentance. Now, regret is the first step towards repentance. I have to see my sin the same way that Jesus sees my sin, that it is an offense against God and that it is hurtful to me and those around me. But repentance is making the decision to not just feel bad about my sin, but to turn away from my sin. And that's what we see Peter not do in this story. One of the hurdles that we have to cross in our Christian life is the hurdle of regret to repentance, meaning I see my sin the way that God sees my sin, and I'm making the conscious decision to turn away from it, meaning I'm going to do what needs to happen to change. The beauty is that this power to change has been given to you. It lives inside of you. His name is the Holy Spirit. There is no weapon formed against you that can stand in this world But when we make decisions to just regret our sin, like I said earlier, what happens in the midst of regret if it never turns into repentance? Shame. We begin to become a people who don't just live in awareness of sin. We live in shackles to sin, enslaved to sin. Because our entire life is me feeling bad about what I have done without actually accessing the power that makes me move on from the things that I have done. A life that is not surrendered will be a life that is filled with regret but lacks repentance. So it's moments when we recognize that we have sinned and we make the conscious decision to say, you know what, I'm going to do what needs to be done to stop looking at that thing, talking in that way, treating my spouse like that, parenting my kids like that, interacting with my employees and the people that I work with in this way, thinking those thoughts of hatred and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at those things, I'm going to call them what they are, and then I'm going to access the power of the Holy Spirit in my life and I'm going to turn away from them, away from them and towards Jesus. He went outside and he wept bitterly. Now again, if we pause the story here, we would have to recognize that this is not maybe the most accurate picture of Peter, but we would think that maybe this is how Peter's story ends. He's a failure. He denied Jesus. He turned away. But something interesting happens about a month and a half after this moment. Peter denies Jesus. Jesus is taken, he's crucified. Peter's nowhere to be found, he's not at the cross. Jesus raises again three days later, proving that he is who he says he was. He's with the disciples. He gives them the Holy Spirit. He ascends into heaven, and he says, now I want you to go. And this man, Peter, 
who sat around a fire among complete strangers and said, I don't know Jesus. In the book of Acts chapter, 30, uh, 22, uh, chapter 2, verse 36, Peter, a month later, says this about Jesus. He says, therefore, let all of Israel be assured that this God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, he's made him both Lord and Messiah. By the way, this is happening in the middle of Jerusalem in front of a crowd of thousands of people. This is Peter talking. Verse 37, when the people heard this, it says, they were cut to their hearts and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? In light of what Peter is saying out loud, these individuals are saying, what do we need to do in light of this news? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of the Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, for all whom our Lord God will call. Peter, how do you go from a man who is denying Jesus to a man who is proclaiming Jesus to the masses? How can we be a church of people who maybe are mildly surrendered to completely surrendered to Jesus? Well, it all centers on one more interaction between Jesus and Peter. It's after the resurrection, but before Jesus ascends into heaven. It's in John chapter 21, and Jesus finds Peter doing what he called him out of already. He's fishing. He has the same moment where he can't catch any fish. Jesus helps them catch fish once again. They go onto the beach and have breakfast together. And then this moment happens. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now pause right here. Do you love me more than these? That could be in reference to the fish that he just caught. That could be in reference to the disciples who are there with him. Do you love me more than these, Peter? He's challenging something about Peter right now. Do you love me more than these? Next verse, it says this. Yes, Lord, he said to them. You know that I love you. Well, feed my lambs, he told him. It's a way of talking about what he wants Peter to do, to, to feed his sheep. That's another name for followers of Jesus, to care for his church. And again, verse 15, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep, shepherd my sheep, he told him. And then a third time, verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter, it says, was grieved that he asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. He was grieved. Why? Because Jesus is challenging something in Peter's life in this moment. And I think it's the same thing he challenges in so many of us that grieves us and hurts us. By the way, that's what the word of God does, by the way. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces you going in, but it heals you coming out. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me is the question he continues to ask him. Why? Because that was the issue in Peter's heart. Peter didn't have a living problem he had a loving problem. And that ultimately is what we have to understand about surrender. That surrender is a loving problem. It's not a living problem. Because I can sit here and say, I want to live better. I want to be more surrendered. And Jesus steps in and asks me the question, do you love me though, Chris? Yeah, no, I love you. Okay, but do you love me? Yes, I love but do you love me? That hurts when Jesus asked me that because anytime our love is challenged, it hurts. But if our loves are disordered, or that is to say, if our loves are out of order, we will find ourselves loving good things at the expense of loving God himself. And we will find ourselves 
orienting our lives around our loves because that's what we do. If we love our family, if we love our money, if we love our house, if we love where we live, if we love our kids, if we love you fill in the blank, whatever we love most will receive all of our time and all of our attention. But what if we sought to love Jesus most? What if we sought to cultivate that thing in our heart, that flame that was given to us by the Spirit of God, and we fanned it, and we put wood on it, and we put firewood on it, and we put different things, like, and we could actually make it become a roaring fire, an all-consuming fire that takes over every bit of us, and what would happen? We would be a people who love God above all else. What is the greatest command? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Why? Because Jesus knows if he has your heart, he'll have your hands. And so in the midst of a world that is chaotic, in the midst of a world where it looks like there is a lot of hope that is lost, it looks like things are going downhill very quickly, Can I just remind you, you have a hope inside of you that is greater than this world. And can I remind you that you and I can be the church that this world truly needs, not by being a church that can give you the best arguments on Facebook, not by being a church that has the best one pithy line statements, not by being a church that's right on every single issue that we argue with you about. We could be a church that could make a difference and be what this chaotic world needs if we ourselves are a church that are surrendered to Jesus. Because when we're surrendered to his love, you know what will actually happen naturally through us? We will display his love and we will declare his love to the world that's around us. And so we're gonna end today actually with the same way that this story in scripture begins with a reminder of God's love, and it's a reminder that Peter received right before this garden moment in a table. It's the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. And at this supper, he gave them some things to do, some ways to think about him, and a meal that can be used to symbolize who he is and to remind his followers of the love that he has for them, so to prompt a love for them in his heart. And so I'm gonna pray for us in this moment, and then after that, we're gonna take a time to take the elements of communion together. So would you bow your heads with me? Hold the Spirit. Thank you for being with us here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word being sharper than the two-edged sword, Lord, piercing between bone and and marrow. And Lord, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for this moment that we get to share together right now where we are reminded of you. We are reminded of who you are and we are reminded of your love for us. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. We pray in your name, amen.